how much like us do they need to become in order to belong? How much like us do they need to become in order to belong? Well, welcome. I glad you're here. My name's Justin and carrying on our belonging series where we're thinking about this New Testament idea that in Jesus we we actually belong together. So if I was to say the word inclusion to you, what what does that mean? What sort of thoughts, ideas, words kind of start popping up into your head? You know, I guess I think about including, being fair, being kind to others, making sure nobody's left behind. I start to think of words like reasonable adjustments and what do we need to change so that this person can access what I am accessing. So inclusion feels like a very kind of active thing that we we have to do to include others. But if I said the word belonging, what sort of words, what sort of images, what sort of thoughts, what sort of phrases come to mind there? They're a bit different to inclusion, aren't they? Because belonging is kind of, it's not something you do. It's just like it's a relational state, a true fact, kind of who you are. Like we well, we belong. It's not that we do anything necessarily, but it's just a truth that we belong. I think both words have uh, real positive benefits to them, but I think inclusion maybe comes with a bit of a danger because inclusion says that there's kind of this realm of normal that if you're in it you have to work hard to include those who aren't normal you have to kind of adjust so that they too can get in there's something that you have to do in order for everybody to be at the table but belonging just says well we we are at the table Often when, when you talk to other nations, people who've, who've migrated into England for different kinds of reasons, that they, they want to be included, they kind of want to fit in. We want to try and help them kind of adjust to the British way of doing things. But then there's some British ways of doing things that we really shouldn't include people in. Like, actually, we should challenge the way that we do things and go, actually, let's not teach everyone to be as rude and inhospitable as the Brits are. Let's not teach everybody that your house is a fortress that nobody can get into. Actually, let's belong together. And rather than go, we'll include you in our normal, we'll go, hey, what do you know that we don't know? What can we share together? How do you represent God in a way that we don't? And I think often the question, how much do they need to become like us in order to belong, sometimes lies under the heart of inclusion. Not, not all of the time. It's the first real theological question that the church grapples with. You know, in the book of Acts, they have a lot to contend with. They've they've got a bit of an admin problem with how they're feeding the widows, which turns into a bit of a pastoral problem. They've got a bit of a persecution problem when the Jewish leaders and the Roman Empire start to move against them. But, But in Acts 11, they hit a theological problem because they're still in the mindset that the Jews are God's chosen people. And Peter finds himself preaching to the non Jews, preaching to the Gentiles. And the Holy Spirit comes. And the other church leaders kind of call Peter back and like, what are you doing? You're including the Gentiles. And Peter's like, I didn't do it. Like the Holy Spirit came on them. Like This wasn't something I intended to do. We just suddenly found out that, hey, they belong to God too. And so by Acts 15, this becomes kind of a real tense point and they all kind of gather together to work out what do we do with the, about the fact, what do the Gentiles need to do to belong to us? And they kind of work out, well, actually not much. If God's included you, if you belong to Jesus, then you belong to us. Let's not make it difficult. Let's move forward together as one body. 
if you missed Cham's opening message from a couple of weeks ago, like I encourage you just to stop now, go back and watch this, uh, watch that before you get to this one. She so eloquently and beautifully talked about there being no outsiders in the kingdom of God. But today we're going to drive a little bit harder at this idea of belonging. Let me read to you from 1 Corinthians 12. We're going to do a bit of a longer passage, verse 12 to, uh, onwards. So 1 Corinthians 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptised into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and were all made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body would be an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God has arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think are less honourable, we bestow the greatest honour. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honour to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honoured, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth and he's saying, listen, you, you don't need to all be the same. You're all different, but you belong together. There's a reason why you're different because you've got different functions and places in the body, but your difference doesn't mean you don't belong. Your difference is the reason why you belong because God has put you where he has put you. I'm... Uh, well, well I, I was going to say I'm into fitness, but that's an absolute lie. I am not into fitness. What I am into is chocolate, crisps and chips, like just, uh, and ice cream as well in the summer weather. Like carbs and sugar, I just absolutely love. And so because I'm into carbs and sugar, I also have to be into fitness to try and kind of keep the things on an even keel. But I was doing workouts at home and I was, I was getting a little bit lazy. You know, when there's only 10 seconds left, so I'll kind of stop now. Oh, I can't be bothered with the last five minutes of this. Oh, I won't do the long one. I'll just do a short one today. And I could feel my fitness starting to wane, the chips still coming in. I was like, I need to do something. So I joined a group exercise class. Turned up on the first day, pretty excited to go. I was like, I'm pretty fit. I think I'll be okay. Looked at the guys in the room. I was like, hmm. You all look pretty good, you all look pretty fit, but, but you're a little bit older than me, I think. Maybe I'll be okay, maybe I'll be able to hold my own in this class. How wrong I was. Halfway through, while they are still storming on, I'm lying on the floor, about to vomit, have lost my eyesight, completely gone, passing out. The instructor's quite worried about me, and I'm like, I'm fine, just leave me, I'll come back into the room. Anyway because Jesus has died for my shame. I went back again to the class two days later. Everyone was shocked, they're like, oh, you, you came back? We thought like you just were passing out and dying last time. I was like, I was, but I'm gonna keep going. And then somebody else came and I was like, yes, because I'm pretty sure by the color of your hair and the state of your skin, you've got grandchildren. <sighs> I might be okay today. And then somebody else came and was like, not only have you got grandchildren, but you've got a beer belly. 
I am not going to be the slowest person in the class. I am not going to be the most unfit in the class. I might not be as good as you guys, but I'm telling you now, I am fitter than you pair. We are on. This is good. My dignity is restored. Pride comes before a fall. Even the grandparents with beer bellies outdid me. Ah. <sighs> I don't know about you, but there's something in me that whenever I find myself in a room, I'm looking around and I'm making value judgments. Who are these people? How good do I think they are? Are they ahead of me? Are they behind me? What kind of jobs do they do? What's their social status? Is there any value or worth or things that I could learn or glean from them? Or actually, am I thinking I'm not one of these people? people, these are not my peers, I don't quite belong here, these people are beneath me. There's something about the, the human heart that likes to make judgments about other people. Uh, in this passage that we've read from Paul, there's, there's three misjudgments that he's calling out in the church. And he's saying kind of, guys, you belong together, so you've got to stop doing these things. Misjudgment number one. I'm not like that. I'm not like that. Let me just recap verse 15 and 16 for you. If the foot should say, oh, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. You know, sometimes we make negative judgments about other people, and we'll come to that in a minute. But often the thing that hinders us feeling like we belong the most is that we compare ourselves to others, and we decide we are less. Oh, I'm just, I'm just a hand. I'm not a head. I'm not that important. Oh, I'm just an ear. I'm not an eye. Eyes are important. Eyes can see things. I'm just an ear. I, I'm not like them. I don't belong here. I'm not as important. I'm not as good. Again, if you, if you missed week one, check it out. We had a story from Jalise and she talked about her experience of belonging at Renewal, but was vulnerable enough to say that actually one of the barriers to her feeling like she belonged was actually her own insecurities. I, I think in my leadership and ministry over the years, this has been one of the biggest hindrances. That I look at other people and the, the way that other people lead and go, oh, I'm not like that. Oh man, I wish I was like that. I look at the way other people teach and I'm like, oh man, I wish I had that kind of ability and understanding to, to grapple with the text. I listen to the way other people pray and it's just so beautiful and eloquent and wonderful and just feel the sense of God in the room and I feel like I'm there going, uh, Jesus, all right, mate, do you fancy having a look at this? If you don't mind, amen, thanks. My, my mother-in-law has a phrase, comparisons are odious. And, you know, we spend so much time looking at what other people can do that we miss what we can do. So, you know, the ear might not be able to see, but the ear often hears the things the eyes missed. The eye takes a glance and misses the bus, but the ear hears that it's coming. The eye can't see the mosquito flitting around ready to bite, but the ear can hear. You have a function. You, you have a place. You are needed. If you see something that somebody else can do that you can't do, thank God that they can do it. But then look at yourself and go, so God, what is it that you've given me? You know, the, the person whose gifting and skill and function and ability that we should be spending the most time thinking about is actually our own. God, I'm grateful for all of the people around me who can do incredible things that I can't do. And God, I'm grateful for the things that you have given me to do. So I can't walk into the foyer 
at the end of a gathering and move around that foyer and speak to everybody and be this extrovert and bounce off people and make everybody feel loved and cared and valued for. I'm just, I'm too awkward for that. But I can sit in a room and be quiet for 45 minutes and let someone pour out their story to me. And rather than looking at those who can do what I can't do, I thank God for them and go, God, how do I do my function to the best of my ability? Be grateful for other people's gifting, but be grateful for how God has made you. There is a reason you are the way that you are, and we need you like you are. We already have a hand, but we need a foot. We already have an eye, but we need an ear. One of the first misjudgments that Paul calls out is the ones we make of ourselves. We look at others and go, well, I'm not like that, so I don't belong. Paul goes, no, that's nonsense. You belong, and there's a reason you are the way you are. God has made you that way. Second misjudgment then is, is the other end of the scale. If the first misjudgment is, well, I'm not like that, the, the, the other end of the scale is, I don't need that. Verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. You know, you, you can rip my eyes out and it will change my life and be devastating, but I'll be okay. If my large intestine blows up, I'm in trouble quick. That thing, if it stops functioning, will kill me in hours. The eye can't say, mm, I don't know what goes on down here. I don't really need that. I'm a beautiful eye. Sometimes our trap is we go, I've got it all together and I don't need. It, if you look at the body parts Paul uses, I think there's a, there's a deliberate play that he's doing here. He says the eye can't say to the hand. Well, in Middle Eastern cultures, what you do with your hands is quite important, particularly which hand you eat with and which hand you shake hands with, because you know what you do with your hands, right? After your large intestine has done its, its duty, it, it deals with the unpleasant things in life. It wipes bottoms, it blows noses, it scoops up mud, the hands get dirty and contaminated and touch all the things in the world that are like, ugh. But the eye can't look down on the hand. Actually, the eye needs the hand. And the head can't look down on the feet. Often you'll see even today in Middle Eastern cultures, one of the biggest insults you could offer is to take your sandal off and throw it at somebody. Often when we see statues of dictators or people who've committed lots of evil pulled down, you will see them taking off their sandals and whacking the statue with their sandal. It's the ultimate sign of disgrace. Again, because the feet are dusty, the feet are covered in whatever's smeared out along the road. The feet aren't dignified, they're just practical. But without the hands and the feet, the head can't go where it wants to go. The eye can't touch and reach what it can see. We, we don't let, get to look down on others and go, I don't need you. We need each other. We need each other. It's one of the, the horrors of our Western culture is that we've come to believe that we are autonomous and self-sufficient rather than understanding, even if I am ahead and I've got it all together, I'm dead without my colon. We need each other. But we don't like being in need, do we? It feels better to be the one who's giving the one who's including rather than being included, the one who's adjusting rather than the one who needs adjustments for. But hey, why don't we just call it as it is? If we're all going to belong together, I will need you to do something for me that I can't do for myself. And you will need me to do something for you that you can't do for yourself. 
when we look around a room, we've got to be really careful that we are not making value judgments about others and going, ah, oh, you've got nothing to offer me. No, 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 no. We need each other. First misjudgment is, oh, I'm not like that, so I don't belong. Second misjudgment is, I don't need that, so that doesn't really belong. No, 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 no. We need each other. Third and final misjudgment, who do you honour? I think honour in the body of Christ is like the blood. It can't just flow one way. It has to flow across the whole of the body. If blood starts diverting from certain areas of your body and doesn't flow, then they're going to die and fall off and the whole body's going to become sick. Well, it's the same with honour. Honour has to flow across the whole body. Let's read Paul's words. Verse 22. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honourable, we bestow the greater honour. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our presentable parts do not require. Now, uh, this can be a little bit of a tricky passage because it sounds like Paul is saying, some of you are the butt cheeks and you need covering. Or if we were to really push it, what he's actually saying is, you put pants over your genitals. And it sounds like Paul is saying there are those in the church who need kind of covering and hiding away because let's face it, nobody wants to see that. But that's not what Paul is saying. Paul is using the analogy of how we treat our bodies to help us think about how we treat others. Because Paul doesn't say parts are less honourable. Paul says the parts of the body that seem to be weaker. The parts of the body that we think are less honourable. What Paul is arguing is for the equality of every single member in the body, every part having a function and every part needing the other parts, every part on a level playing field going, we are needed and known and we need and know. But then Paul says, if you think there are parts that are less honourable, then you should be treating them as more. If you think there are parts that are less presentable, then you should be giving them more dignity. It's a way to counteract the value judgments that we make. The moment we find ourselves looking down on someone, we need to go, aha, I need to make sure I lift them up. The moment we find ourselves feeling like I don't need this person, we need to go, ah, I need to make myself vulnerable to them. If we judge someone as less, then the issue is with us. And to counter that, we need to treat them as more. Paul is saying, if you think someone is an ugly butt cheek that needs covering up, then you need to treat them with even greater dignity and respect. Let me give you two sharp tests as to whether honour is flowing right in, in, in our church. Imagine your favourite Christian leader and you bump into them in the foyer at Renewal and you say, hey, come to my house for lunch. And they go, yeah, sure, I'd love to come. Who would, who would that be? I like Nando's, by the way. Um, maybe it's Johnny and Louise. Maybe it's uh, Steve and Vel. Maybe it's one of the, the worship team or Joel, our youth pastor. Or maybe it's a preacher that you watch on telly. Just somebody that you really look up to and you feel like God has used them to impact your life. And they're coming to your house for lunch. And your budget for the shopping is what you've donated to Helping Hands this month. I did tell you it was sharp. Because here's the thing, we should honour leaders. We should honour those who serve well. And, uh, and you shouldn't put yourself in a financial problem, but when you're being hospitable to people, it's great to show them honour. Now, we don't, shouldn't demand or expect it. If it's a cup of tea and beans on toast, well, it's our company that is actually what we're coming for. But it's right to honour those that we esteem but it's right to honour those who have nothing. 
and it's right to show the same honour to those that society have pushed down to the bottom. And it's right to show the exact same honour to those that society have written off and said you are less. And we go, no, 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 no. In the church, you are more. So we're going to honour you. And if you come to our house, we're going to treat you like the person we esteem the most. Why? Because who's the person we esteem the most? Who's the person we lift up the most? We exist to lift up the name of Jesus. And in Matthew 25, Jesus says, when you do it for the least, you're doing it for the most because you're doing it for me. Second sharp needle test. Who do you think you can learn from? Who do you expect to learn from? We had a baptism uh, gathering at Renewal a few weeks ago from filming this message. Uh, great baptised nine people and we had some young people uh, that we were baptising uh, and, and I said to them, how do you, like live in the room with a mic, hadn't prepped them, just like, how do you cope in secondary school? Like, how do you see God at work? How do you survive that environment? Because that environment is so tough. 13 year old David says you just got to understand if you wake up in the morning that's a gift from Christ you've just got to understand if you've got to school safely that's a gift from Christ 13 and I've got to be honest when I'm looking to grow in my leadership when I'm looking to grow in my spirituality don't always consult the 13 year olds in the church but that's the most impactful thing I've heard this month and I've read lots of books, I've attended some lectures, I've listened to some podcasts, I've watched some preaches. But 13-year-old David spoke the word of the Lord. Who do we think we can learn from? Because yes, we can learn from those that we think are beyond us in the faith. But the little children in Renewal Kids have got something to teach us we don't know. The homeless person that's just walked in off the street may know something of Christ that you don't. Those that you think are not as intelligent and clever and progressive and smart as you may actually be the ones that have the lesson that you need to hear. How do we honour each other? So you should honour those that study and dedicate their lives to teaching and you should honour those who you think can teach you nothing because they probably can teach you a lot. Here's the kicker, right? As we kind of drag this into conclusion, you belong. That's kind of Paul's argument. This is not an issue of whether you belong or whether you don't, you belong. Whether you feel you're good enough or not, you belong. Whether you feel others don't belong or not, they belong. Whether you give honour to the body or not, it belongs. You can't change this fact, it is a truth that we belong together, just like my body belongs together. But here's the question, in our belonging, are we bringing health to the body or are we making the body sick? Often the body gets sick when things from outside the body comes in. Coronavirus, flu, a cold. Sometimes the body gets sick because a particular organ starts to fail. The heart starts to give way. The liver starts to give up. The knee starts to go. And none of those things are pleasant. But the worst kind of disease is when the body starts attacking the body. Cancer when cells start working against each other, when cells start stepping out of their function and role and start to disrupt others. Autoimmune diseases where the body starts to attack its own organs, those are the things that kill you and if not treated well, kill you quickly and the treatment for those things is not too paracetamol and some time off work. When the body attacks the body, it brings such ill health it's the same in the church. We belong together and we have a chance and an opportunity to bring health to the body of Christ or to make things difficult for all of us. And Paul's argument in this passage is it's your judgments that you are passing on yourself and each other that are causing sickness in the body. Because you look and compare yourself to others and think you don't belong. 
You look at others and you think they don't belong because they're not good enough. And you only honour the people that you naturally like. And Paul says we all belong and we have all got to be pulling and working together. So we've got to change the way we view each other. I'm going to finish with a quote from Martin Luther, that great reformer who, who preached a sermon on the man born blind in John 9. And he says this, Christ came to teach these eyes and to take away the blinds in order that we should not make this distinction between young and old, beautiful and ugly and so on. Rather, all are equal that he is a man with our flesh and blood, a body common to all. In Luther's sermon on the man born blind, he says that really the biggest impact of the fall is now that when we look at each other, we make judgments and we make distinctions. And Paul is calling us to view that we belong together and we are all equal of honour and dignity and fulfilling our function to bring health to the body of Christ, to lift up the name of Jesus so that the body can see the gospel go from one to many. I belong, you belong, we belong. Hello, my name's Naomi. It's been great to have you with us for our message here at Renewal. If you want to find out more about what it means to follow Jesus, you can visit renewalcc.com forward slash next steps and you'll be sent a few videos which might answer some of those bigger questions that you might have. Likewise, maybe you just want to say hello to the team. So you can email hello at renewalcc.com. And then if you're really enjoying all of these videos, what you can do is click the subscribe button, which is the wonderful red button that you cannot miss on your screen to be notified of any other videos that come in. You can also listen to our messages on the go. So if you visit renewalcc.com forward slash media, you'll be able to see podcasts and then that will also link you to the YouTube channel. But maybe actually you just want to support the work that Renewal is doing. And you can do that by visiting renewalcc.com forward slash give and you can choose where your finance goes. All that's left to say is take care, God bless and have a great week. Hopefully we'll see you soon.